Welcome to the E9 Podcast, hosted by me, Seth Harshman, and my friend, Steve Jones. Our goal is to talk with people from a variety of backgrounds and who are at different parts of their journey with the Enneagram and get them to share their story with us. Today's guest is Eric Fisher, host of the Beyond the To-Do List podcast, and Eric is a five on the Enneagram, just like Steve and I. We talk about why fives have a dark sense of humor, who's allowed in our castle, and why our hyper-awareness is a blessing and a curse. Thanks for listening. I don't see it that way. I'm the Chick McGee. I don't. (laughs) Uh, Thanks again for tuning into the E9 podcast. I'm Seth Harshman here with Steve Jones. And today our guest is a friend of ours from college, actually. Known him quite a while. Eric Fisher. Eric is the host of the Beyond the To-Do List podcast. And what else did you, Eric? Anything else of note? Anything we should... I should mention. That's a great question. Or now how about Um, you mention it? Yeah. So yeah, that's my biggest thing is the beyond the to-do list podcast. Yeah. And then I also, and I've been doing that for six years now and podcasting outside of that or in cumulative addition to that, whatever, uh, for like another three to four years prior to that. Cool. I used to do a comedy podcast (laughs) with my friend Rob Swingle long time ago. That was, I remember Rob. Very fun. Uh, that's what that's what got me into it, or at least got me started. Is that something that people could still find? No. Is it still worth finding? Actually, it's it's if you were to, yes, because we did some fun stuff. But there there actually is some ways to maybe find that if where those files are hosted on the free hosting uh, still exists. But I have no idea where. You're not going to give us any clues. I'm not. No. Gonna, if you were to look up Talk Shoe as a and and look up the WBR podcast or We're Both Right, you might find it. But that's from like 2007. So, so if we have like some internet sleuths out there, you could yes, Eric with a K, Fisher, <laughs> talk 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 shoe talk shoe talk shoe yeah. WBR. Yeah, those are the clues you have to go you, on. You We're might be able right. to find it. We're both right. Yeah, that was a really fun show. That was that was a show where we both worked in the same place, took the same lunch hour, drove to his house, went to a spare bedroom where we had the stuff already set up, much like this setup in a, in a weird way. Yeah. And we would just start recording. And it That's was awesome. fun. And we I mean we would there was a while there where we were doing like 3 4 or more episodes in a week just to kind of get and then we started slowing down. We're like, "Uh, I don't feel like doing one today." <laughs> you know, how that goes. It's like, yeah. Ew, this is a chore to get it really right. So yeah, that was kind of the first foray into to podcasting. That was 2007. And then we did it off and on a couple more times. And then I was a co-host on a few other like social media shows. One was called Social Media Serenity. I think that's still out there. But it was like all about how to use... I was a co-host and it was all about how to use social media without like going crazy, which I think was ahead of its time. That, that show actually yeah. really should be re... Uh, revived, you know, rebooting that like a movie and all these other TV shows they do today. It could be the yeah. Roseanne of podcasting. The, the Roseanne of podcasting, right. yes. So, uh, with the, the, the way things cycle anymore, I think it's about time we all, like, we, you start rebooting all of the old podcasts that right. were good at one point. You know, the recycling thing isn't new. I mean, uh, Hollywood has been remaking movies since there was sound added. There was that initial. There was that initial boom of remaking all the movies from the last twenty years that had made, been made as silent films. Now we're going to remake them with a little better technology and with sound added and all that. And that just got the ball rolling. Steve, that's a, an interesting piece of information, and I say that in order to, to also say that maybe now is a good time to mention that Eric is a five, like Steve and I. Uh, so this is an all five episode of E nine. Buckle today. your seatbelts. Yeah, I don't. I don't anticipate this being very bumpy. Actually, <laughs> if anything, um, uh, I think it's going to be pretty low energy. As a matter of fact, I, I wanted to go ahead and say, don't worry. We'll edit out the periods of like twenty to thirty minutes of silence that will be happening 
uh, as we sit here. Like, it's going to take us five hours to record this. We'll probably have about uh, 35 minutes worth of audio for you. Well, we'll probably have about 20 minutes of us as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, See, but I've been doing this uh, for a while, so I kind of switch over my uhs and ums into just pauses. So much better. Oh, uh, Through practice. So much better. So... That's that's like the only advantage I have he, over he, you guys. He, at this yeah, this point. is this is great. We've actually brought in an a podcast expert who's a five. <laughs> uh, oh no! Every time I do it, my th- my my brain's gonna go blank. I'm gonna catch myself saying uh, and my brain's well, just gonna go blank. Uh is not so bad. What's bad is the uhs that run into words because they're hard to trim off. Without oh. making your your vocals sound strange, Steve does all the sound editing right. for the show. It's the the us that blend in. Those are those are murder. Do I do that a lot? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mur- the murderous us. Well, no, because it's it's a it's a professorial thing. You'll you'll be like, uh, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, in there, and and with the editing there, I try to just like cut around it. And and I almost so here so here's a tip actually so here, th- I know this show is not about tips of podcasting by any means <laughs> but what it. I've actually gotten into recently is saying before we start to my guest I say my job is to make you sound good on this show so if you at any point feel like you need to pause and start over again with what you were wanting to say and say it better. Feel free because I will cut out the first take. Yeah, and I feel like I probably get a lot of first takes cut out because I tend to start sentences one way and then my brain starts analyzing that sentence and saying, no, that was the wrong way to do that. And then I have to start it over again. Uh, I don't know if other fives do that, but it that's really common. It invites a lot of opportunities to uh, splice the two and make you say something that you weren't <laughs> trying to say at all. <laughs> yeah, the, the the whole out of context. I should thing really as well. I should really listen more closely to <laughs> the previous episodes of E Nine. I mean, I trust Steve, but that might be a huge mistake. Sometime I should show you uh, the raw audio, like a, a bit of it, and then what I end up with, just so you see what I'm doing. Because I actually try to do minimal editing, but do all the important stuff, yeah, yeah. which is cutting out a lot of my audio. You try to leave as little of you in the show as possible. Well, you know, it wasn't. I in so far in every episode, I end up saying less than anyone. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that is uh, supposed to be how it works, but he, here's the thing: I'm kind of a. It's Seth's uh, podcast. Th- I don't see it that way. I'm the Chick McGee. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> A Bob and Tom reference, really. So I don't, I don't see it that way. Uh, I, I'm a social five, so it's a little bit more easy for me. Easier yeah, that's for me. fair. Uh, and so I can at least, I have a, a certain side of my personality that I can turn on to do this. And Eric, you've talked about that too, where you go into podcast mode. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing for me is I, I am an introvert podcasting and technology make it I, I look at it like putting on the Iron Man suit. Huh. I'm Tony Stark and now I'm Tony Stark like now I'm yeah. I, I am Iron Man. I now get to do all these extra things, but I still love to take the suit back off and then go grab yeah. a drink and sit on the couch and pretend I'm Tony Stark. I'll let you decide how much of that's true, but like <laughs> it's it's a switch. I'm an introvert versus extrovert extrovert, which is a which really yeah, I'm actually curious to ask you that. Like, are there certain types that are more prone to introversion or extroversion? Oh, absolutely. Outside yeah. of, is there just a? Because I am an introvert, I'll, and I'll be honest, I, I don't flip a switch. So we're all fives here. Um, I have trouble conceiving of what an extroverted five would be. If we're talking about introversion versus extroversion, as in terms of where you get your energy, not just are you shy or not. Uh, yeah, because that's yeah. that's a whole other. That's um, I don't I don't think there's such a thing as an E. That's shy or outgoing. That's different yeah. from introvert or extrovert. Yeah, reg- regarding um, energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, part of the whole five dysfunction is uh, an obsession about energy, 
and recognizing that people tend to take energy, um, but that you can uh, conserve energy by being alone, right? And so part of the five dysfunction means that um, like, well, like Seth said, I can't even conceive of what an extroverted five would look like, right? Um, but sevens, uh, some sevens are more or less extroverted, right? But by and large, sevens are going to tend toward extroverted energy. Twos have a drive toward um, social interaction rather than being alone. Threes as well. Fours, I could see because of their competitive nature, could go, either, can go way. either way. They fours can, either can be, go either way. You know, super excited and competitive extroverted or super competitive i'm going to go alone in a corner and knock this whole project out introverted yeah yeah exactly and i've known uh both introverted and extroverted fours it's not one way or the either except for a very few i'm if I, it, let me ask it this way is five the only type where you go basically every single five is going to be an introvert I mean, that is just about, I, I really do have trouble imagining an extroverted five. If, it, if you're out there listening and you're an extroverted five, I would, we'd love to have you on the podcast sometime, like contact us through our Twitter account, please. I mean, uh, I think that it sounds fascinating, but I really do have a hard time imagining it. Is there any other type that you could go 100%, they're all going to be? The closest thing would be a nine. Nines are, can be fairly social, but I think by and large... They're their withdrawers in a similar way that fives are. Sure. Um, maybe not quite as extreme as fives, as many fives are. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if if I, all I had to draw on was my own personal experience being a five, yeah. and realizing that I am introverted, and when I can appear to not be introverted, and, and someone would say, "No, Eric, he's an extrovert," is because I've flipped a switch, and I am, yeah. I am exp- I am. It's like afterburners. Like you, you flip mm-hmm. it on, and you go full tilt. Like I am social. I am yeah. super social yeah. right now, and then I crash and burn later when I'm out of vis- out of exactly. visual. Exactly. So. Well, that's the thing about fives, right? Fives go to eight in strength and in health. Right? Exactly. Well, that's yes. the thing about fives, right? Fives go to eight in strength. And in health, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. eight is is very extroverted, very world filling kind of energy, yeah, yeah. Um, but then we crash out of that uh, pretty quickly. Um, but also, um, we usually do this in unhealth, but eventually mm-hmm. we can learn right. to do it intentionally in a healthy way. Go to seven, mm-hmm. and seven is more fun, extroverted energy, right? Sure. So both of the directions that fives easily go are are very extroverted. Yeah, just within the base personality, a, a fi- fives are definitely going to tend towards being introverts. Um, in fact, it. I mean, I, I feel like introversion is actually just even part of their like like you said their their basic dysfunction. It's part of the definition of a five. Um, it seems to me. I mean the the basic formation of a five personality is uh, closing yourself off from mm-hmm. others and as a means of conservation, right? Yeah. I mean, when we're talking about introversion, extroversion, we're talking about energy. And that's one of the, I mean, that's what the five has their pulse on is their own energy. So ultimately so, we're saying that all five, all five of us, all three of us as fives sitting here are draining each other as we speak. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Literally. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. Right, because um, one of the tasks for a five is to identify first of all that not all people take energy away from them in the same way, and that some relationships, when when you've built good, trusting, healthy relationships, you can be in those places and not have your energy drained and potentially even gain energy from them. Yep. There are certain forms of social interaction that can fill you with energy, but that's such a foreign thing for fives. Uh, early on and it's not native it's something you have to kind of train into and and this is something i want to go ahead and ask you eric um since we're already on this we're gonna we're gonna back up here in a little bit but since we're already talking about it do you ever hang out with other fives yes yeah one in particular that i can that i can think of and is it ever just you and him with no one else there yes uh Talk to me about that experience. Like you both know your fives and because I think fives uh, hang out together differently than most people hang out and, and other people have a hard time adjusting. 
Yeah. Um, so this is one of those things where, uh, for example, I wouldn't have originally labeled them a five because uh-huh. of how outgoing they can seem oh, to be yeah. in public. Uh-huh. But they are also, after a while, I've noticed the signs where they're the person who, even though I was hanging out with them and then also somebody else shows up, they say, hey, I need to go off and do some alone time. Hmm. They will literally call that and say, Can, you know, I'm going to go do that. And, you know, that's that's just how it works. And I think to myself, oh, I'm cool with that because I could also use some of that myself. <laughs> yeah. Let's 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 all separate, you know, let's separate and come back, come, come back together in a bit. So, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else unique about it. I mean, again, like I said, you wouldn't think that we I, he, he is also introverted, self proclaimed mm-hmm. and also a five just like me and yeah i mean like i mean the the crossfire the back and forth the banter just it's there and you wouldn't think either of us were fives you would think we were more like eights but again that's the mm-hmm. whole we're with someone else and we turn it up or go to go to an eight or a seven yeah in that sense or in that circumstance so steve do you have any, any thoughts on like the experience of uh, like fives hanging out with fives I mean, obviously, you and I hang out quite a bit. Yeah, one of the one of the great things. I mean, this is a common thing, not just for fives. It feels like there are a lot of different kinds of people who come to appreciate this dynamic eventually. Um, it seems like maybe nines uh, are prone to it, twos are prone to it, but especially fives um, really appreciate the moments where. Um, you have the right kind of friendship with the right kind of person. You can allow conversation to slip into silence for a while and it's totally okay. Hmm. Like there's, there's no discomfort in that. Like I said, that's not solely a five phenomenon, but fives really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw this thing once and it hadn't even really occurred to me, but it made complete sense when I saw it about how to get, um, an introvert to open up. And the way you'd get an extrovert to open up might be active listening and asking open-ended questions and all of that stuff. That crap doesn't work on most introverts because we've got our guard up against that stuff. What you do is you sit beside them and you shut up, right? Mm -hmm. And once you've proven you can be present and not talk long enough, then you're considered someone worth opening up to, right? You can be allowed it. You're less threatening, right? And I feel like... That's a consistent thing for fives as well. When you know that there is someone who gets your needs for stillness, who also has a sensitivity to the noise of the world and and, and mental noise, when they have an appreciation for doing very little together, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, There's there's such a security in that. And so I feel like when fives get together, they all want to naturally move in that direction at some point. And when they recognize that in each other, it's it's a really um, affirming and comforting thing. Yeah, and so I, I ask about it because uh, this is something that I've talked with fives about before. Um, just kind of noticing the pattern where fives tend to have very low energy hangouts, where it's we're sitting and watching TV together. There might be long periods of silence. Maybe maybe. Uh, we're both reading a book and, you know, every 20 minutes I'll pop my head up out of my book and say, Hey, Steve, I, this is interesting. What do you think about this? And I'll read you a passage and we'll talk about it for five minutes and we'll both put our heads back down. And, uh, it, it's very low energy, very low expectation. Yeah. Expectation is a big part. Yeah. Of it, right? And, and there is something about fives just know what fives need when hanging out. It's just, it, it comes very naturally. Um, and other times when someone gets introduced into that dynamic, who's not a five, they have no clue what to do with it. Yeah. Like it's, it's it's not the normal social pattern, right? Especially if it's someone more extroverted, someone who, who likes to either supply energy or needs energy. They don't, it, it throws them off. And, and I've seen some people feel almost like desperate in the midst of those hangouts where they're like, no, we have to do something. We have to like, like something needs to be happening right now. 
I can't stand this. We have one friend in particular who yeah. spends more time with the two of us than about anyone else does. Yep. And there are That's times when of. that person is trying to like uh, prompt some kind of response out of us. Yeah. Trying to rouse us into some kind of activity because he just can't handle it. So your original question was, you know, thinking about myself as a five hanging out with another five Mm -hmm. and the person that I'm thinking of in particular, um, though they they do fall into that, like they do make the like public claim of, hey, let's do quiet time now, Mm -hmm. like just making it stated because they have navigated relationships, you know, they've been friends with a lot more people, probably more people than I have been. Yeah. And so they've got more, uh, experience with that and i am definitely still i mean if 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 there's a conversation happening which there you go if there's a conversation if. happening you can notice my language there um on my part i would say there's that the balance is probably 60 them 40 me mm-hmm. and sometimes even shifted a little bit more their direction more, yeah. more like 70 30 so they're still very much much more talkative than i am yeah but they're still then the person who's like, okay, like shut it off. Hmm. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna we're gonna go into silent mode now for a while. So, I'm not sure if the person you're talking about is the same person I have in mind. Um, but for a five, uh, appears to be awfully extroverted, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is from a family where that's sort of the way of life is to be very social and outgoing and all that stuff. And yeah, the few conversations that I've really had with that person one-on-one, I don't say much. I really don't say much. Um, I feel like, I feel like he just slips into that normal sort of eight social energy really easily. Well, and and, I, and if we story. are talking about the same person, I can tell you it's an adapted learning on his part yes. due to his family. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Exactly. Yeah, it would be interesting to figure out what everyone else in his family is and see. Because I think that as a, I have my own little hunch about the Enneagram that um, particularly parents leave echoes of their type on you. Mm-hmm. Where like I'm a, I'm a five, but my dad was a nine. And there, I have some really... You know, I have some nine tendencies there. Uh, my wife is a six, but her mom was a one, and she's a very one-like six. She has some some stuff that she's picked up. It'd be interesting to to type uh, the this particular guy and his uh, his parents and and see if maybe there's some echoes there. But the, there's definitely there's definitely some family influence going yeah, on. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. But it all comes down to again, it's that whole knowing what you need in what circumstance. Yep. Regardless exactly. of your type. And so in order to fulfill external expectations, you show up and you play the role, regardless of it's mm-hmm. if it's fully you yeah. or not, and then you step off stage. Yeah. And that's how I that's how I do do it for me. Yeah. Determine like how much that's can really I compromise? Where do I have to set boundaries around it? Right. Right. As an illustration, I, I just recently had a conversation with someone uh, who is absolutely not a five. And uh, I, I'm still in recovery from this long trip that I took. I've been just exhausted. So I wasn't sure I wanted to do much of anything this day. But I finally got up enough energy and I thought, hey, yeah, maybe I'll come and spend a little bit of time with you. This person wanted to spend some time with me. Uh, and I'm thinking one or two hours. Um, and this person came back with like this exuberance, like so excited that I was going to come spend some time and was just spitballing possibilities, right? But it looked to me like the next 24 hours were planned out. Like, we could do this, and then we could do this. And I'm like, I'm not leaving my damn house. So like, you just you just screwed it. Yeah. Sometimes even people spending their energy, like there's a vicarious <laughs> loss of energy, isn't there? there? There really is. Like, I don't know if it's this way for for other fives or maybe even other extroverts, but there, there are some people where they're very full of energy and I get a contact high. There's others where they're very full of energy and I swear it's because they're vampires because they're stealing mine. Like, it, and it's... And, and I, I can't always tell who's going to be who. Sometimes the first person I meet someone, I'm like, oh, you're too high energy for me. And then I hang out with them a little bit. Like, no, this is great. Like, I'm really enjoying this. They're supplying the energy. Then there's others where... Um, Someone told me the other day I, uh, that 
I said, you know, I, I think that I was joking. I said, you know, I think the eights have so much energy because they, they steal it from all the fives and that's why we're so low. And, and she said, it's, there's no scarcity. You know, we live in a world of, of abundance. And I said, I told my friend, I said, I've never felt an abundance. Yeah, no, <laughs> not <laughs> once. I don't know what world you live in. Yeah. I do not live in a world of abundance. <laughs> Where is this abundance? <laughs> We've already recorded quite a bit, and I haven't even gotten to my first question yet. <laughs> I mean, I guess I did ask a question. That's where all this started. But, uh, Eric, normally where I'd like to start off is, I mean, you're a five. Uh, what does that mean to you? Tell me what it means for you to be a five. Yeah, so being a five to me, uh, what it means is, <laughs> it, it, in a weird way, it gave me a sense of comfort knowing mm. I was a five because then suddenly it made sense as to why I was the way I was, which is this mm-hmm. very much like go into your head and be only there and try to create um, some sort of not strategy, but like understanding of how the world works and connect, you know, this to that, or, you know, connect sociology to history, to, uh, you know, in other words, building connections of contexts to have a worldview to understand how the world works outside yeah. of myself. And I mean, and, and one of the weird things, I don't, and you know, you guys are both five, so I'd love to hear if you've ever thought of this. Have you ever had the thought that like, why am I the person who's stuck inside of this body? Like hmm. I'm looking yeah. out from, it's almost like the movie inside out, but there's only one person instead of five or one feeling instead of five. And it's like, <laughs> like, Oh my gosh. Like I'm this person that's inside of this, like controlling this big giant robot body that's made of flesh. And it, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm I, guessing this is something relatable to you, but that's something that every once in a while I'm like, someday I've got to figure out how to like explain this because like, I'm hoping I'm not the only one who th- feels like this. Mm-mm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, fives tend to start with the assumption. There's there's a, 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 an assumption even behind that question, and it's that you you see yourself as not the body isn't part of you. You're a se- self stuck in a body. You know, you're you're a meat sack, right? And and so and fives tend to just end up feeling that way. That you know, the um, how did I get stuck in this particular meat sack? I could have been in any of these meat sacks. Or why so am even I confined? Ju- even just that assumption here, yeah. yeah, as well is just another aspect of it. Yeah. When I have panic attacks, I start to feel claustrophobia about being stuck in my own body. It's mm. not about the space I'm in. It's about this whole like I'm stuck in this body, and eventually, no matter what I do, this body will die. And then what happens to me? I can't escape what this body is eventually going to do to me. Yeah. You just freaked me out. So it's the body's fault. <laughs> That's Absolutely fascinating. It's the body's fault. That's mm-hmm. fascinating. And, and, Absolutely. And, it, and it's almost like, it's almost like you're, you're inside of a, a van that is locked and drowning yes. in the sea <laughs> exactly. and you're inside oh it and it's, God, it, yes. and then the, and the body's going there, the body, the van is going down and you can't get out. And then, yep. Uh, anyway, Absolutely. Body equals mortality. Yeah. What is the point of my existence? That's wow. how quickly it goes. Let me ask you this. This is another thing. Uh, when fives hang out, did, does it go dark when you're hanging out with other fives? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll easily throw out like stuff that we don't mean mm-hmm. necessarily because we know that uh, you know, bouncing off each other that we don't mean it. It's just a matter of like, it's almost like saying, "Hey." That's not really where I'm at. Like, you know, gosh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to put this. But is like, it like there's a way of coming to terms with like, here's the crap we're having to deal with in the world. And those things have an effect on us, even if we don't, even if we don't agree or don't appreciate them, there's still a kind of processing that has to happen. I, I think, let me, let me see if I can get 
at what you're getting at another way. Fives, fives tend to see, um, be, be very aware of absurdity. And since we're looking at large scale things and creating systems, we see the absurdities within the system. And oftentimes those absurdities are dark things. We see dark things. Uh, not only that, fives are the most prone towards feelings of meaninglessness of yes, all the types. That is yeah, true. If, if anything, and I would say we were talking earlier about there's no lack of abundance and that we don't agree to that uh, when it comes to, to energy. I agree to it in theory. In theory, but I like... Don't, I just don't know how to access yeah, it. I don't I, experience I, it. Yeah, I, do I don't think, experience it. I do think there's no lack of abundance of absurdity. Yeah. <laughs> that, that there's, wow. a never ending, uh, there's a never-ending... There's a never-ending stream of absurdity, and we live in the middle of it? Yes, that, that is there we very go. much where... Uh, That's, yeah. That that is kind of the life of a five, um, and we don't uh, we don't always feel safe to subject others to that. Uh, and I think this is something that comes out when fives hang out with fives because we feel comfortable, and when we feel comfortable, we off will have access to that brash eight energy, and and we'll just start letting stuff out that that we've been seeing and observing, and and all of the absurdity and and. And we'll even, the way we say it, because fives tend to, oftentimes, like we're in information mode, become so matter of fact. So we'll throw out this really <laughs> crazy, absurd stuff in just a kind of matter of the fact way. And I know other fives can handle it. Right. Other people, when they hang out, they're just like, they can just be, what did you just say? So slapped around by it. I'm trying to think yeah. of an example that we could include here on the podcast. I don't want to repeat most of what I said, <laughs> See, but it, yeah, but it can hang feel out. it can yeah. feel like walking a line between meaninglessness on this left side yes. and mm -hmm. absurdity on the other, and yes. you walk the happy so so called happy middle of a lot of stuff can be shrugged off as meaninglessness, or you can you can go you know you can go that whole ecclesiastical way of oh my gosh everything's meaningless yes. yeah yeah yes. or everything's absurd in a like funny way and those are both kind of connected in the mm -hmm. same way uh -huh. you just kind of walk the line in between what i was going to say was something to do with the whole extroversion thing fits in here hmm. and i'm i'm i i lost my thought i hope i can get maybe it back you'll regain it, was, it um i was going to add one more thing is the part of the way i think of this and have thought about it for a long time is that uh there's so much dark absurdity that I'm able to, to pick up on, it can be overwhelming. And so using humor as a way to kind of um, ride the stampede instead of being trampled by it is, I mean, for, for me, that's, that's kind of the way I think of it. I can, I can either find a way to, to saddle this thing or it, I'm going to get trampled by it. So as dark as it is, I might as well saddle it and and uh turn it into to some humor cuz that makes it feel a little bit more under my control. Right. I can I'm more okay with it. What I was going to say in regards to not necessarily throwing out those crazy things that other types would be like I fear for your sanity because you said that thing. <laughs> yep, yep. That's where my introversion comes in handy. Yes. is I can mm. not say those things yes. though they're in my head. Yes. Oh yeah. 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 So I'm not giving people access to all of me, not just to protect myself, but protect them. Exactly. Because I know yeah. that they can't handle that darkness the same way. Because, well, we run into this occasionally with our third friend who frequently hangs out with us. Mm -hmm. um, if Seth and I say things, we know that it's not going to be taken personally because it's going to go straight to the head and be processed by the whole absurdity machine yeah, yeah. before anything else. And maybe eventually we'll process it emotionally. So Steve and I will but actually say things about each other that fall in line with this kind of yeah. really dark yeah. uh, kind of, just as a way uh, of observation of absurdity. Yeah. The, the darkness of, of life. Right. Yeah. Um, but our friend who is a four uh, always takes things personally not because he's like an insecure person, but because everything gets received by the heart. Yeah. And then maybe later gets processed by the mind, right? And so we'll do this game with each other, and then I'll just turn and shoot the same thing at our friend, and he's just bowled over by it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he tries to laugh along with us, and I'll sometimes miss the fact that I've just crushed my friend. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we can't I mean, it probably would have been people. better if you would have just uh, maybe just pulled out a knife and stabbed him. 
<laughs> at least attack. that at least that way he wouldn't have like nervously laughed at it and you would have known that he <laughs> heard him. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Fives don't have an absence of, of emotion whatsoever. Not at all. Yeah. That's nope. the, I think that's the hard thing, is then every once in a while, the emotion can almost wave over the mind. Yes. Like mm-hmm. we, and you want to retreat into the mind, but it's like, like, there are weird times where it's like, I have to almost watch myself from getting too emotional, or like when I'm watching a movie, yes. when I'm around mm-hmm. people. Because yep. it's like, oh my gosh, this really just hit me. Brain somehow figure out a way to shut the rest of me down right yes. now so that that doesn't come Five, out. Five, yes. yeah, we shut down the yes. emotions. Um, well, because the reality is that um, because our hearts get so sheltered, they, they stay within the castle, they're, they tend to be more sensitive than other people's hearts, hmm. right? Because yeah. they, they, they're not calloused, they're not exercised. They're, they're tender and kind of innocent, and uh, it, it's, if, it's something, like when, if something penetrates the walls, it, it can just obliterate It's us. like when you go down a few layers of skin, and that, that skin isn't used to being exposed. And so if right. you poke it, yeah. it yes. it's extra tender. It exactly. hurts. That's exactly. what a five's heart is, because we've not, we've not exposed yeah. it. We've not taken it outside. So good luck accessing it. But when yeah. you finally do access it, you get all of the immaturity, and yeah, yeah. which goes back to the which goes back to <laughs> the whole wonderful uh, immaturity. <laughs> well, that goes back to the whole exoskeleton thing that I was talking about when I met reference Tony Stark and yeah. Iron Man. Yeah. Oh heck yeah! So uh-huh. oh heck yeah! No, um, so the Iron Man thing wasn't about drunkenness and womanizing, because that's how I relate to Iron Man. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Okay, uh, you, I mean, in in a lot of ways, you look at it and you see Tony putting on that front. But technically, wouldn't he be a five? Gosh, are we really doing this? He probably is. There's oh my <laughs> god, there, there are so many lists. There's a lot of ways you could the go with Avengers it. and Enneagram, Anyways. and uh, I have issues with most of them. Yeah. Um, we recently had a conversation about Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh and, and the, Enneagram. the Enneagram. Yeah. And I feel like some of that was. What, what's weird about that is that was at the very beginning of your trip, right? When you did that, I had actually been, had that same conversation with my wife the day before, and then you messaged me, "Hey, I just did Wayne the Pooh and Enneagram, and here's what I came up with." Our results were really similar. Yeah, but some of them are obvious. Some of them were a stretch. Some of them are a stretch. Anyway. Anyway. Anyway, but yeah, the exo skeleton being stronger and putting it on. It, it, it's you. It, I mean, my metaphor here is different in this instance sure. than it was earlier where it's like mm-hmm. you put on your eight skeleton. In this instance, it's more the, you know, your, your emotions are the Tony Stark and your, mm. your other fiveness, your strong five shell of your brain or your thoughts or whatever well, you want to call it, it is kind of the guarding of it but you see yeah, where I'm going. and it's you but, but you have the like the little jarvis voice in your head yeah that's like the the, the that's super exactly, analytical yes. the you know let me talk to yeah. myself hey hey self yes mm-hmm. yes eric but also it's vulnerability is the thing that drives it which is his heart yeah there's a lot of there's <laughs> anyways we could, I, I have a lot of <laughs> what, you, now, what you can't see right now is that steve says that and then he has this <laughs> crazy look on his face and i wasn't sure how to take it See, what you can't see is inside of my head right now. I'm making a list of all the things from the films since I watched them <laughs> yep. earlier this year yep. uh, in a marathon up to Infinity War with my daughter that I'm like, yep, that checks, that checks. Here's another reason why. And I'm not saying it out loud. I'm actually talking and it's really weird multitasking. So you've actually kind of spent a, a lot of time developing this like Tony Stark as a metaphor for the five. I have not spent any time. I'm doing it right now, oh, okay, literally okay. while okay. we're talking. Oh, so That's but you're, now, you're going back to the movies right now. Exactly. Like my fiveness yeah. is... is in full gear internally right now, mm-hmm. kind of doing it in the background. So fives are natural phenomenologists. We're always watching ourselves, watching ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think, well, I actually think that that's true I because what like I've learned is watching me. One of the goals, <laughs> one of the goals of the, of the Enneagram is to learn how to become present, right? Like not, not stuck, you know, in the future or in the past, but to be present. And I thought I was doing a pretty good job until I realized, and this, I think fives actually do a pretty good job of being in the present, except that they do it wrong. I'm in the present, but I always have a notebook out and I'm making notes. Yes. I'm never actually, I'm, I'm super consciously present instead of instead of just being just conscious I'm just present, present but not in the world around me yeah 
Yeah. I'm always present in this moment and um, the world outside of me is excluded from that presence. Yeah. So anytime something happens, some phenomenon t- is taking place, my first reaction is to then start taking notes on how I'm reacting to it. Yes. And so the, the discipline then of trying to be present in the moment, it's like, so for me, the moment when I was most aware of this pattern, a few years back, I was a part of a bowling league, right? And I was, wasn't very good, but it didn't take me long to realize that when I wasn't thinking about what I was doing and I was just present, and engaged, I would actually bowl just fine. But as soon as I started thinking about what I was doing, I would mess things up like crazy, right? I would just do absurdly terrible things. Mm -hmm. And so I knew then, all right, uh, the task at hand is to not think about what I'm doing and just be here and do it without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. How the hell do I do that? Right? So the the only tools I could find to do that were to think about not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Like to try to be present by paying attention to what I'm doing and making sure that I'm present, all of which defeats the whole thing, right? Yeah. You, You can't think about being present. You can't think about thinking about it, right? So it's difficult to develop the very tools that you need to get outside of it because by default, we prefer the tools that shut down that process. Yeah, and I actually think that this is, and I'm I'm not sure how far I can get with this, but I think this is one of the reasons fives need to develop a better relationship with their body. Absolutely, absolutely. Because the, the, the body is the thing that's, that's actually there, present in the world. Dance, sports, martial arts, even weightlifting, all these yeah. things are very good for fives. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's almost like having a, a sixth sense of self-awareness over... You know, in in proportion to every other type where others would struggle to be self-aware. That's not our problem. Our problem is is we're too self-aware. We're hyper self-aware. We're hyper self-aware and then hyper self-aware to a fault where we're so aware that then we almost become inactive in doing anything beneficial with even the minimal awareness we would have needed to have been fully present and... um, engaged in the moment. Yeah. I mean, most people, when they talk about self-awareness, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Fives actually take it so far to the extreme that it's no longer a virtue. It's a vice. There's a, there's a, there's a middle uh, way in self-awareness where no self-awareness is bad. Too much self-awareness, hyper-awareness is bad and you need to find that middle place. Yeah. I think there's a link here between this tendency of ours to be hyper self-aware and have a difficulty being present in the world around us and the tendency of fives to have this feeling of meaninglessness. Those things are connected because meaning is not like some inherent thing. It's not something that we necessarily find internally, though we talk about finding your purpose and discovering who you really are and being true to yourself and yada, yada, yada. And for a lot of people... Um, that can be a helpful direction to move. But for fives, the search for meaning has everything to do with getting out of the prison of your self-awareness mm-hmm. and actually engaging the world around you, right? Being present in the space your body inhabits rather than just present in the mind. That's where our experience of meaning comes from. It's by being physically present with people. It's by engaging the world like haptically in a hands-on way. Uh, the experience of nature which a Mm -hmm. lot of people talk about nature doing this for them, but it seems like fives in particular, whatever, whatever natural phenomenon bring us out of our minds and allow us to actually be, to have an experience of being one with the world or one with Mm -hmm. nature. Yeah. Not necessarily in the full on mystical sense of like everything is one, but just the fact that you exist in a place, you don't exist outside of a place. Like context is everything and context is what gives meaning, right? So I Mm -hmm. think our tendency to pull up and and abstract ourselves from the world has everything to do with our sense of meaninglessness. Yeah. That being said, I still do that constantly and have a hard time getting out of it. Sure. Um, Did we at some point say that which one, that when we choose to, uh, I forget the right terminology. See, I know my, I know my Enneagram just enough to be dangerous. Uh, (laughs) 
uh, the uh, when we swing into or, or move out to towards being an eight or a seven, which one of the is one of those more healthy than the other from from a five, or does it matter? Um, they both can be both. Typically, typically seven, at least early on, you're you're going to go there. Um, well, okay. Some people would say that it's less healthy to go to a seven. Uh, I think that it's actually a way of acting out that keeps you from falling into worse health. It's like a, it's, it's like a blow off valve. Um, uh, it's a, cop- and it's it, a set of coping skills. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's a red flag that, um, maybe you need to check in with things or you might get less healthy, but, but it's actually like a, a kind of an internal mechanism that keeps you from getting less healthy. Um, and if you're staying there too long, then yeah, that's probably unhealthy. But so, and then eight is you go there when you're comfortable. Um, but then there's also things that after you spend a lot of time working on the Enneagram, you can integrate some of the healthy aspects of the eight back into your personality. So it's not so much that you're going there, but you've actually pulled Adopted. something down along yeah. that line. Yeah. Okay. So d- that's, that's I, probably more than you were asking for. No. So go ahead and say what you were going to say. So I- I think for me where I was getting at with that and being a five is by having a healthy self-awareness of mm. my hyper self-awareness over time, I've been able to adopt some of those eight um, tendencies or, or mm. ways of being yeah. that, okay, you know what? I'm just going to let my, in, instead, I'm going to just let my head shut off versus the other way around where yeah, it's, my yeah. head is what's existing and I'm going to shut everything else off. I go not full tilt, but like at least, you know, the, the, in other words, on a soundboard, you'd like, you dial it down, you'd, sure, you'd bring it sure. down and let something else kind of take its place and then be able to be fully present instead of just self-aware. Really good analysis. Actually. Uh, one of the things that I picked up that you said, there is one of the, the tools that all the Enneagram people, uh, that's a strange classification, but everyone recommends is, you know, the first thing you do is just start observing yourself. You learn how to observe your own personality. And and so when you noticed at some point that a hyper awareness is part of your personality, part of how you try and make your way in the world, and then you became aware of your hyper awareness. And by just by observing that, just by seeing that and, and observing when it would happen and when it would take place, it automatically makes it weaker. Just by noticing that, boy, I'm really like, I'm hyper self-aware and that's not good. That's not healthy. And so you start to see it, you see it when it takes place and, and that it used to be a thing that operated kind of in the darkness. It just did what it did, but then it, you brought it into, into the light and that makes it weaker. And so it, it, it lost some amount of power over you. Right. Um, is, is, does that sound like what you just described to me? I'm trying to describe it back yeah, to you in yeah, the same yeah. way. That's, that's okay. very in much it. Way. Yeah. And, and I would say even, you know, for so let me give an example. Like my wife would be, uh, we, we would go to her family's side of things for a uh, larger side of things, larger family, uh, gathering for say, uh, a holiday. And, around all these people, not only was it introversion, but it was just like super hyper aware of all these people being around. And suddenly it's like, I'm in my own head and I'm talking to nobody and I'm sitting over on a chair by myself and I'm put, pulling my phone out every few mm-hmm. minutes to just kind of look. And cause that was, because that, and we, and we could go there the whole, like withdraw, withdraw mm-hmm. and having that, instant like pull it out of your pocket black hole at all times anyway um do you address this on your podcast yes going to move that out of my head for a second and not go there but she my wife will be like you're just like not even here and i'm like i am (laughs) i wish but it's but but but, (laughs) but, and and uh, and and, you know ashamedly that that is the truth i don't Mm -hmm. really want to be there but it's not because of them it's more because of how i am there Mm-hmm. You know, and I want to, so. And and you're also probably somewhat on some level terrified that you're not enough. You don't, you don't have enough energy, social energy, yes. emotional energy. You don't have 
uh, on some of you, you're not, you're not capable to, to manage this situation. You're not competent enough to, to make your way through this. And so it'd be easier to just withdraw everything, hold on to what I do have instead of like fearing that I'm just going to lose all my energy and, and, and come to a point where it's like, Oh yeah, I wasn't enough. Yeah. And, and so the thing that I have, I mean, I'm not like amazing at it now or anything, but one of the things that I've kind of learned to do is one, put the, go ahead and let the hyper self awareness antennae all the way up, hmm. tar- lean into it, look for opportunities to then go and then take some of those eight tendencies I've adopted and be fully present in a smaller group that's say playing a board game or something. Mm. And then I fulfill that I'm seen doing it when it's done, (laughs) retreat again, recharge as much as possible. And then maybe find the next thing. Pick your spots. Exactly. Pick your spots. Yep. That is, I mean, and I'm not saying again that that's perfect. You know, I've got that perfected by any means, but like, that's the way I'm approaching it now. And it it works much better than just feeling sure. uh, It's probably one useful tool amongst many. Yeah. yeah. Right. To, uh, rather than, rather than always be half present to be fully present certain times, knowing that at other times, perhaps you can afford to not be entirely present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause I've, I've been listening to Seth work this out some on his own. And I'm hearing you talk about it some now being a five in family. And, and what does mm. that mean? Because, yeah. um, I mean, I live effectively by myself and I have for a few years and I still, I struggle to be present enough with people, right? Even I'm, I'm still constantly fighting this battle of, of getting enough castle time, right? Um, it's hard to feel like I've gotten enough and I can't conceive of being in your situation where my castle is not you know, my space and my time. Mm -hmm. Um, Where do you get that need met? How do you balance that need with the need to be present genuinely and fully with your family? I can't conceive of doing that personally, but I'm watching it happen with other fives. So, so here's another interesting wrinkle. And then I want to hear what you have to say about this. (laughs) Okay. Because so for example, today um, I'm here recording with you guys. And then when I'm done, I can go back home and my family, they all went shopping like out of town. Mm-hmm. But part of me doesn't want to go home and be by myself because I suspect I'm kind of sick of being around just me in a weird mm. way. You know, in that, like, it, in other words, I'm tired of just talking to Jarvis. <laughs> Oh, like yeah. Like, I can't even get away from myself, <laughs> in other words, in a weird way. Yeah, there, 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 there are need times. to shut down the inner dialogue. Yeah, um, there's definitely times when, uh, especially in my own house, I've never liked being in my own house alone. Um, like, I'll, if I go to coffee shops, I've, I've had conversations about, like, why, why do I have to go somewhere else to work? even though I could, you know, work from home. And that's the situation I'm in right now. You know, I, every day I leave my house to go find somewhere to work instead of just working from home. Uh, the, the ghosts of my family distract me. Like the emptiness of the house is so present. Ah. Um, that I, it, can, I can't, yeah. it's hard for me to work there. I can identify that. Cause I mean, again, I work from home myself Yeah, and, and now it's worse because we had to just put down our dog. Oh yeah. Like so you knew three weeks that. ago and now he's not even there and it's like, oh, it's just me and, and me. Yeah. It's That's just so strange to me. Just me and my inner, li- my, my inner voice. We crave that solitude so much, but it can be oppressive to you. Yeah. There's, there's be. times when. Um, especially if my anxiety is heightened because okay, then, because then the, uh, the inner monologue gets, gets really oppressive and it's, it's never even just like fun stuff to think about. It's, it's see, I just, like, in those moments, just me beating myself up constantly. If, if I can't handle it or find a way out on my own, I just drown it out with self-indulgent things like fallout. Yeah. And apparently that's not what it's like to be a father. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but when other people are around the, at least for me, uh, first of all, let me say this as, as a five, 
Um, yeah, people do drain you, but there, there is some difference, especially with your own kids. I don't think I've ever felt drained by my kids the way other people drain me, or especially other people's kids, if I can be honest about that. <laughs> um, but like, you know, fives have that, we have that need for space and please don't bother me, but rarely does that mean that my kid can't sit on my lap. No, right. The castle just kind of includes them. And so I've, I mean, I've, I've heard uh, people who are married to fives, like they talk about, you know, I'm worried about when we have kids someday. And I said, don't worry about it. It doesn't, it doesn't, they don't count. They're, there's something different there. They're, they're, they're enough part of you that they're just, they don't, they don't mess up what's going on there. Okay. If you don't mind, yeah. can I turn up the, the heat on that a bit? Sure. Kids are in the castle because they're enough part of you. What about the spouse? Because that's a totally different relationship. That, that relationship has to be managed more. Yeah. And, and I think it comes down to, for me, with kids being in the castle, really comes down to if they can, much like if fives got together and we're cool with all of us being present with each other but not talking, it, I'm cool with, like again, my kid being on my lap and they're doing their own thing and I'm doing my own thing, or we're watching That's some true. together. Like, that yeah. often is, is how it's not as big of a deal. But sometimes you know with my kids, it's like I actually can't do something with them because I have pre-engaged commitments or expectations or whatever. And, but then I want to say to them, I can't, you know, daddy can't do that right now, but I can later. Let me get this done. And then I'll be with you. Yeah. And I also feel like the stuff that I do with them doesn't drain me like the stuff that I do with other people. Like if, if my kid wants to sit down and build Legos, this isn't like, like this is going to drain me. This, this is one of those things that's going to drain me. I hope I have enough energy to no, like, like, Playing Legos with my kid doesn't in, doesn't in, drain me like other stuff does. And in a weird way, it actually... So that's one of the things you if have there, to If there's any relationship that is life-giving... Yes. And activities that are life-giving and you receive energy out of it, it's those. Yeah. And, and you, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a rewiring, in a way, to mm, receive those yeah. as energy-giving yeah. instead of that it's taking. Because what's the alternative in this moment? I could be doing something that is taking my energy that's even if it, even if it's a solo activity and it's quote work mm-hmm. hey i'm taking a break that's one of the beauties of you know working from home too is like hey once people are home later in the day it's like i've gotten a chunk of stuff done hopefully mm-hmm. and i can take more breaks and i can be engaged with them then go back and close down the day and yeah, then be with yeah. them in the evening it's anyway it's a kind of a i talk all about this on my show yeah so. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> You asked Steve, I'm, I'll check back in with you. Where, What are you hearing? I can relate to that a bit, being mm-hmm. a teacher and enjoying mm. uh, my classroom the way I'm able to be a teacher, which yeah. is a very non-standard situation. There is a certain part of my castle that those students get to be in, and I get to be mm. a certain person with them that doesn't require a lot of energy from me most of the time. And uh, it's a very natural thing, and it's easy, uh, and I appreciate that. That's one of the best things about this job that I have, right? But part of the reason why I asked about the whole spouse Yeah, you asked about one. And then we went right back to the kids, didn't we? And that's that's fair. Okay. I mean, I, I might have tried to derail us or, or, or turn the corner a little, uh, a little early there. But the reason why I ask is my experience of that is different. Mm-hmm. Because I have trouble being consistently present to like, a significant other in a way that I don't with a student. Mm. Or the way you describe being with your children and they can, they're like in the castle, they're, they don't necessarily demand energy or it can even be life-giving. That seems to come and go with a significant other, especially if you're living in the same Yeah, space. there's definitely highs and lows it in, really comes and in that relationship. And so yeah. it can be more or less demanding, right? Yeah. And how do you manage, because I'm currently dating somebody and we don't live together, but still this person would be willing to spend all of their time with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding it very difficult after a few years to manage this, right? Sure. Because, yeah, part of me does want to spend a lot of time with this person. And part of me kind of wishes I wasn't in a relationship at all so I could still spend all of my time by myself, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Those desires are both still there. I had a professor in seminary who... 
we were re- reading a text by Hans Urs van Balthasar in this class. And he said, man, these, uh, these Catholic monks and the way that they're able to put out so much work, it's amazing, right? He goes, I mean, kind of makes a married guy like me a little jealous. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, like, yeah, like they, you know, they don't, they don't have those commitments and boy, look at what they're able to produce. They have and time for so many and, activities. Yeah, I know they, they, they can they, think of all the thinking that they were able to get done. Right. Um, and I, and I actually kind of under, like he was saying it jokingly and I kind of understood, like I got the joke, but I also was like, oh yeah, like there is that trade off there. I recognize that having a relationship like that is actually very, very good for me. Mm-hmm. The way it's good for me as a five is by grounding me uh, in the world outside of me. Yeah. You know, yeah. when I'm with this person, I'm outside of my mind for the most part. I'm engaging the world, right? It's a healthy version of me mm-hmm. that I have trouble accessing just on my own. It's wonderful. Also, I have a lot of projects I want to do before I die. And... I can't do those when I'm with this person because I need to be up here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I need to get up in the, in the head to do it. And this person draws me out of it. Yeah. Well, I, you, one of the smartest things I've ever heard from anybody is uh, everything's a trade off. Every single thing is a trade off. I hate it every time you say it. Yeah. And, and so, you know, every decision we make means that we're excluding other things. Yeah, it's 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 opportunity cost. It's, yeah. When you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to every other thing you could be saying at the same time. Yep. That yes to it's only you have one vote of yes to every. Unless you're a seven, which is well, why that's a joke. Well, which is why <laughs> the initial question was about balance, right? Yeah. How do you find that balance in your personal lives, especially it's hard. being people who work from home? No, it's. Uh, this has been a a constant struggle and one that I didn't even realize for a long time I was having was like, I wasn't giving enough time and enough energy. Like even maybe the time was there, but my energy wasn't present. And so I thought I was fine, but my wife and kids weren't getting anything out of me. And so this has been a struggle. Um, and it, it is, it's really hard. Like how, how do you, and, and here's what I'm finding is that a lot of my fears are bullshit. <laughs> yeah. The fear of I'm not good enough, I'm not competent enough, I'm, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to have enough to offer. I'm I'm realizing how that when I wasn't aware that that's what was going on in the background that had so much control over me and that held me back from being present. And so, like, so I've, I've had to kind of rethink about, like, you know, I'm, I'm good enough to be these kids' father. I'm you're, good enough. Good I'm enough competent enough. And I'm going to make it. And, yeah. And gosh darn it. And gosh like darn it, my kids like me. Um, I'm, I'm good enough to be a husband. So I need to be a husband and not just, like, totally withdraw. Mm. Because, that, because it's when I withdraw that, no, I'm not good enough. Mm. Well, it also goes back to that whole abundance thing that we've mentioned twice now. This will yeah. be the third time. Yeah. Is you've you've got you're, four kids. You're I've a got really two. damn good counter. Did you know that? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, in my experience with two kids, and I know you've had this with four kids now. Is you I have, have four, four kids. Well, you started off with two. You had twins first, but uh-huh. still, uh, and then two more. Um, I had the there's, one. There's that counting and again. And then the other. You're, you're killing it. And I started <laughs> off with zero. I'm maintaining the zero though. <laughs> I had a dog for a while. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's the, you, you've heard it said somewhere before, but it's this whole idea of, I can't imagine having another kid. Like, how will I have enough love to give them also on top? And it's like, no, it's, I mean, it, it is one of those few instances where it's like, you can't no, imagine you, it. You have enough. And yeah. then you have another one and you're like, well, I, now I somehow have the same amount of love for both of them. Yeah. And you with, you with four of them counting. And then, the, but the problem is that I, yeah, I have enough love except that I'm not always putting that love out there. Like I'm, that's part of what gets withdrawn because if you're, if you're withdrawn and you're not present, then you have that love in you, but you're holding it and you're not, you're not giving it to them, which is a a tragedy. And so that's what I've, I've been learning just more recently is no, like I need, I need to be more present. 
in a lot of ways. Sorry, di- I didn't. I kind of no. I think you there. you're right. No, I, I okay. mean it, that's all I wanted to point out is it's just the idea of. Um, you you what you're doing is you're actually pointing out like when I said a lot of these fears are bullshit. That's how they're bullshit. Yeah, there's enough there. Yeah, it, it, more than enough. Y- you you feel like like in in some unknown way, the 100 percent you had originally for. In my case, the 100% of love I had for a child that was mine, mm-hmm. for my first daughter, my yeah. first kid, that then when the second kid showed up, suddenly it wasn't like... You didn't I, have to split it. I didn't have to it split it. It wasn't 50-50 for them. It was now 100 and 100, and it was yeah. like suddenly I had double in a weird abundant way. Yeah. So Yeah. Totally. And you just can't... You, you can't conceive of that idea prior to it happening. Hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, I imagine there's ways that can happen besides besides kids, but I think you're right. Like, yeah, you, um, there's enough there, enough love there for you to invest into something. And I'm sure it's and there. you have to discover it somehow. Yeah. Kid, kids are a really great way to discover it. There's other ways to discover and, and, it. Though. And in a weird way, that's what I imagine then for somebody who maybe couldn't have kids or already has a kid or whatever, but like adopts where it's mm-hmm. not their flesh, you know, yeah. it's not their blood relative. But they enter into a commitment yep, and to it's that other there. person. Suddenly, it's there, and so it's it's this idea, and, and and in a weird way, that's one of those things that I mean. Even right now, I'm sitting here and I'm trying in a very five way to grasp this. So I have a, I have how a friend. This, how does this work? How yeah, does this yeah. magical suddenly doubling my love thing work? I got to understand this, you know. Anyway. Yeah, I think it's good for <laughs> us to hit brick walls every once in a while. But I, yes. I have a friend who he has several of his own kids. Well, he has two of his own kids and two adopts. And his own dad asked him, so what's it like, you know, having an adopted kid? And he says, it's just like it's my own. Yeah. It's, in, in, in my mind, in my heart, it, I, don't, I don't think or feel any differently. I, and I have a, a nephew um, who who's adopted, and I think my my brother and his uh, his wife would say the same thing. Right. And and I I mean I can tell just from the way they've they've cared for him, and th- this is a kid that came over and needed a lot of care, and I can I mean I can see it like they love him the same anybody would love quote unquote their own kid. He is right. their own kid. Yes. But. I'm glad to hear that I don't need to go have a couple kids really quickly. Well, I mean. Honestly, <laughs> you mentioned you had a dog. His name was Linus. I think that Linus was very similar for you. It it, it kind of came at a moment of realization when you realized that Linus wasn't just a dog. He was he was someone who was really caring about you um in a significant way and then like that had an impact on you that I think was similar to to having a kid. To be honest, yeah, maybe so. I mean, I always scoff when people um, treat pets like their children, or or will talk about themselves as a parent to the to the animal. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, was Linus, man, that was Linus, phrase dog babies comes to mind or fur oh, baby that pisses me off so yes. much. Um, I try not to say I, anything. Unlike the other two people in this room, I'm not judging. Whatever. There's a there's, well, I'm judging myself. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. There's there, I have a lot of internal disdain mm-hmm. when those things happen, but I try to be, you know, generous on the outside. Um, but no, I, my experience was that, was that he was my equal, right? Mm-hmm. And this is, this is not like I was being cared for, right? Uh, without recognizing it. And so even though on one hand, uh, I really don't like when people try to equate pet ownership with having children, mm-hmm. um, I can't deny the fact that, um, you know, he, he totally did affect me that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it affects you more that way because you're a five. Uh, I think because again, I'm kind of going through it right now having, we had to put our dog down because, and, and, you know, I had my annoyances with him, but now I miss those annoyances. Yeah. It's a really weird, like he would, that your girls, cause they were coming to the door to be part of carpool for us last year. Yeah, yeah. And he would sit there and wait. And then I would be like, Hey, Hey, when they'd come, because I wouldn't want him to bark, but he would. And he was just, I mean, he was just announcing people were here or he was just excited to see you or whatever. And 
and now that that's not there, every time I come in the house, yeah. it's like that's missing. And yeah. for me, I was like, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna get another dog anytime soon. And yet today, I said, you know, I'd actually be willing to just go out and get another one mm-hmm. right away, just mm-hmm. because I don't like being going back to it, being alone in my house, in the house. most yeah. of the day, every day by myself. And hence why you've seen me out of the coffee shop a little bit more, yeah, more yeah. recently <laughs> with the kids back in school. It, it's funny. So. When, uh, when I told the girls that we weren't going to be dropping them off at your house every day, that's, right. that was actually the first thing they said was, but who's, who's going to pet Pedro every day? Yeah. <laughs> like who's going to interact with Pedro? Who's, yeah. who's going to like, like, well, and there were days where Saturday and Sunday when there wasn't school, he'd be waiting. Oh, really? Yeah, he'd be waiting by the door. Like, he'd wait at the top of the stairs looking down at the door they'd come in. And I'd kind of be like, hey. like, And he kind of, kind of got over it, especially yeah. with the kids being home from school. Yeah. But, like, he waited for them. So, anyway. Yeah, that's funny. So, dogs don't... You know, let me put it this way. Not just dogs. Pets. No, I have a cat, and then I feel nothing no, for it. No, you're yeah. right. I, the, fe- I feel nothing for it. I bet we could... <laughs> We could st- anyway. I don't want to go into the whole let's type the cats. Don't worry. There's there's, a, there's other there's other that people, all exists. It's out there. Anyway. There, there, there's other people in my house who love the cat, and so the cat receives love. People can love cats. Yes. Cats are not dogs. Cats are incapable. It's of true. Love. Uh, anyways, oh my. I hope we don't have a strong, sorry like a very this heavy is, like. See that cat was one of, that was one of my insensitive five things yeah, to yeah. say, and I said that one out loud because I've gotten more comfortable with. And I've completely, obli- you know, been oblivious to the audience that's listening at this. Is point. all of your it's brashness just, like? Does it does it always develop into cat based humor? Not at all. Oh, okay. No. I just wonder. Dogs at least have the potential to begin blurring the line with personhood. Cats don't. Well, and they take on personality uh, traits of their owners, boy, and vice versa. I think so. That, yeah, they do. Gosh. Yeah. Anyway, mm. <laughs> the closest <laughs> the closest cats get to having personhood is eating lasagna and hating Mondays. <laughs> yeah, the the E nine podcast has now turned into the feline podcast. The feline. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so one thing that I've noticed amongst fives, um, and I, uh, it'd be interesting to find out if other types do this, but I'm not sure they do, because I think this is, this is maybe a function of our hyper-awareness. Um, but we all have these social tricks that we've kind of learned. Like, we have a social survival kit. Yeah. And sometimes we'll share different tricks that we've learned, like little life hacks um, the, that we've picked up along the way. And I've, like, I've exchanged things with fives and they've told me how they handle or, or the way they think about certain situations. It's like, oh, see, that helps. I can, like, there was uh, one thing that I used to do, I don't do it anymore, but uh, when I'd be working from home and I would keep ESPN on in the background. And it was... Not interesting enough that it was distracting, um, but uh, there was something going on in the background which I like to have, um, you know, like a managed distraction. But I would pick up enough of what was going on within sports that I could have conversations about it with people later. So I've done the same thing. Uh-huh. It's, it's actually a productivity kind of hack that I do where it's like, hey, Netflix in the background is not uh, not, uh, it's not non-productive. It's not mm. procrastinating. It's a, so I'll actually put, uh, cheers on oh, in genius. the background. And it's like, I don't love cheers so much that I want to sit and always consciously watch it. Although there are moments. Yeah. Yeah. But it's got this kind of, it's, it's so well done for, for its time and its era and everything like that. Um, that having it in the background, I can pick up on the jokes and the rhythms and the things. I don't have to look at it to see it. I can turn and glance every once in a while. But like, it actually, in a weird way, and this is also an ADHD technique as well, Mm -hmm. is to preoccupy one part of your brain 
so that another part of your brain can focus at the thing and the task at hand. Yeah, a managed, so, a managed distraction. Yeah, um, I do a similar yeah, thing. Nice. It doesn't. It's not something that helps me on a social level. Like I'm never going to pick up uh, enough sports knowledge to have a meaningful conversation, you know, with the normals. <laughs> but um, I do use. Uh, like Buena Vista Social Club and other similar things because I'm not good enough with Spanish that I get caught up in in lyrics or anything like that, but the music's well done. You know, it's got the right kind of energy, occupies a certain, uh, certain portion of my brain. I can focus better. And sometimes, isn't it, you need to find other things that will supply the energy for you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Where, which, which again, I think is, um, not true. It's not like the energy is coming from the music. It it's, helps it's, to pull it's helping parts us, of you yeah, out. Yeah, right? it's it's helping us to access energy that we kind of weren't we weren't able to feel it until we turn on the music and then we feel the energy, and and so I think that that's part of um, uh, being a five two is is we assume that we don't have energy when really we're just not feeling the energy we do have. We do, we've somehow lost access to it, and and that's one way to find access to it. Absolutely. When I need to engage aid energy, um, there are certain kinds of music that are useful for that. Yeah, So absolutely. I find that certain Marley albums are great like that. Yeah. Uprising, Confrontation, they're, they're good for drawing out really productive aid energy yeah. in me. Rage Against the Machine. Uh, Rage Against the Machine. My goodness, if you I have need, to be careful with if that. If I need you to be do. aggressive, uh, Radiohead will pull aid energy out of me, but it, not in a constructive way at all. Mm. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure Radiohead pulls eight energy out of me, but it, it does have... <laughs> oh, I, I tell I, you what... I, I, I get super irritable. It's totally eight energy. It's just destructive. F- yeah, for me, Radiohead does something totally different um, where I lose uh, certain songs. I lose my hyper-awareness, actually. Really? Yeah. It, like, I get so drawn into the song that, like, I just, like... Uh, I don't know that it's exactly the right kind of present, but it's it's a different kind of present than I normally am. Modest Mouse does that for me. Mm. Yeah. Um, Certain Radiohead songs do the exact opposite for me, where I become hyper self aware because of the song, mm. based on like the content of the song, probably. Yeah. So, you know, I would love. Uh, I, maybe this is something, boy. If if our listeners were so generous. I would love to hear about if there's any fives out there listening, like what, what songs drop, what kinds of energy or make you aware of the energy resources that you have. So yeah. Interesting. We have a, we have a Twitter account and you could, you could, uh, at us on there. E nine podcast. Yep. E the letter nine, the number podcast. (laughs) Don't, don't spell all of that out. It's E nine pot. You'll figure it out. (laughs) Um, It's not the letter nine. It's the number nine. (laughs) (laughs) Make sure you get that right. Not you, Seth, but the listeners. E, the letter nine, the number. (laughs) Podcast. Spelled P-O-D-C. Oh, anyway. Um, So, Eric, there's something I've been wanting to ask you. First of all, let me me start before I get to the question. Um, Explain to me... Uh, beyond the to-do list, this podcast that you have. Yeah. So what do that, you do there? So, so that's an example of me getting way too into my head as well, because the title, uh, it was like, oh gosh, I can't narrow it down to just productivity. I want to talk about everything that that is connected to productivity, <laughs> fringe-wise. So we talk about, you know, so so for and for me, it was also this kind of way for me to set up having conversations like this Mm. where where you can just dive into like in other words it was free coaching in a weird way i was like i can talk to this person (laughs) i can learn from them and i can talk to this person and i can learn from them and and so it was like kind of a deep dive siloed off every week and i've been doing it for six years um but again when it came down to it, it was like what do i want to talk about productivity isn't really the thing it wasn't really the first thing it was like if i could talk to people which again, at first was like this whole like, okay, get out of your head and just be present with that. That's a whole other thing that's had to been practiced too. Mm. Like I've had to apply. That's a lot of why I've been able to practice. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Sometimes when I'm having, a, when I'm still, when I'm doing a podcast with somebody and I'm interviewing them, although I try to just talk about it as if it's a conversation, um, I will have almost an out of body podcast experience where I am observing me 
uh-huh. interviewing yep. them, which is which is strange. Yep. But anyway, um, it it's 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 hard. It's it can get really weird because then it's like they finish talking and I'm like, oh right, uh, you know, I <laughs> yep. was listening. Uh, no, I don't say that to them though. I was but really the, I, listening to myself listening more I than I was lis- actually listening. Yes. Yeah. So, but the idea behind it was is if I could at the time I didn't know I was a five. Yeah. I mean, I've only known about the Enneagram since, let's see, we're talking 2018 right now, summer of 2015. Okay. So about three years now. Um, and so this would have been back in like 2012 mm-hmm. when I started. So years before that. And I, at the time just thought, Hey, I like talking to people. I like recording that and then putting that out there. Uh, what do I want to talk about? And it, it basically came down to, well, what do I, what would I want to get out of them? And it was like, well, how do they do what they do? How are they? And it was like, oh, yeah. self-management, not like in a corporate way, leadership skills and all that kind of whatever. Yeah. And not even productivity in like a nuts and bolts, like ones and twos and spreadsheets and things like that. It's more, I mean, again, it's, it's, if I had to express it in a, in a different way, it'd be holistic productivity. It's like Mm. living your life, but, but better. Like the the art of being human, the art of making it work in a lot of ways. That's exactly what it is. So you're asking to have a look in their toolkit. Yeah, really. For the most part. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Hey, tell me, and I try to get stories out of them and like, Hey, so tell me about a point where you messed up with your productivity or here's the thing you're known for. Like, how'd you get to the point where you actually know or or are an expert in that thing, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm talking to people about all over the place, different stuff, like again, minimalism Mm -hmm. and, uh, forming habits and how to get better sleep um, different seasons of life, different seasons of the day. Like there's this, what is it called? A chronotype. Well, there's different, there's different parts of the day where we're, we, based on our chronotype are more naturally, um, able to do certain things. And of course that fits in with introversion and extroversion and, and the Enneagram. I mean, we, I've talked to people, a certain person on the Enneagram on my show twice before. And so that, Mm -hmm. you know, that was interesting. Um, it, I mean, it really is all about figuring out, it it really is self-discovery really when it comes down to it. It's figuring out who you are, what your skill set is. And then maybe where the gaps are between where you want to be and where you where you are and where you want to be, and figuring out how to kind of start to fill those in and actually start to succeed in any kind of a yeah not just your work life but your family life and your personal goals and all of the above. I mean, it is when you boil it down, it's like oh, it's self improvement, but there's nothing wrong with that inherently if it's yeah. done well. So that's my goal. Well, at least you didn't set your bar too high, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so your podcast is about everything. So when you, when you talk so, about beyond the to-do list, well, you might as well not even mention the to-do list. Like, right, it's right. everything. It's, be, uh, <laughs> my my show is about the beyond of, yeah. of where you're at right now. Yeah, Achieve yeah. your highest self. Yeah, oh. no, it was, and see, it's absurd. It really is. It's one of those things where, like, in marketing, because that's like what my day job is. Is like this this whole marketing thing where it's like, no, you want to really find your niche or your niche or however you want to pronounce that word. There's this whole idea that you want to really figure out who your your real audience your true audience really is and for me it's people like me who are kind of the, they're they're at home, they're working from home yeah, yeah i, I yeah. just you know my avatar is me which is a whole other weird five thing to go into anyways um <laughs> <laughs> Seth frequently says that he doesn't have a body right he has an analog avatar yeah, yeah the, this isn't my body it's my analog avatar yeah but that's the that's a whole other marketing thing where it's like you figure out who your avatar is, you, you, who is your ideal market, your ideal person, and all that. And it's just like, you know, in the end, calling it beyond the to do list, saying it's a productivity podcast, but it's about more than just productivity, yeah. being able to yeah. kind of stay close to home but exit away from that mm-hmm. a certain ring or two concentric out from productivity in and of itself, yeah. where it's not just about email or, you know, so. Yeah, it, oh, it kind of rain, it rains it in without making it like, yeah. You've already done some of this, but let's draw like try and draw some really clean lines. Is like so. Um, 
how does what you're doing with your podcast relate to you being a five? Well, see that, and there's the beauty of it. It was like I was be I was thoroughly being a five when I started mm-hmm. the show without knowing it. I had this purely inquisitive wanting to figure out the world and myself. Yeah. And so as you know, I can learn from others how they do the things they do and figure out how to do that myself also. On top of, I can observe myself in the situation learning from them. <laughs> uh-huh. And all the while, like the whole nature of the show is not just bringing these people in to teach my audience. They're there to kind of teach me in a way also. Yeah, yeah. And there again lies in like certain layers of hyper self-awareness. And so that's, I mean, that's really what it comes down to is, is I created a self-serving yeah, podcast it, for that reason. I think it's, it, it's kind of fascinating what, what you're describing is that fives want to become experts about something and you created a podcast in which you are in the process of becoming an expert. That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so like you starting out, you weren't the expert. Right. And then, you know, you've been doing this six years now. Yeah, you're kind of the expert now. Yeah, there there are a lot of people who... I still don't necessarily reach uh, the point of saying that about myself. Sure. Just just because I don't care to. But And we don't have to go into why or any of that, but it's just that... But there are others who... That that is how they see me now. Mm -hmm. And I accept it from them when they say it. But yeah. I don't like. Oh, I'm a productivity expert. Like I still, I have to say it that way. It's well, required. yeah, you need to. Con- in order for the podcast to be successful, you need to maintain the learning stance. True, but even then, like right? I, I don't know if it's a it's a false humbleness or or what, or if it's or if it's kind of like with you, where it's like, am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? And that kind be, of a thing that'd be worth I, looking into. Is it? Right. Is it? I mean, a lot of fives will say that I've just never really felt even smart. Like fives accumulate information like crazy, and they'll just go, but "Yeah, but I don't, I don't ever feel smart." In fact, I'd, I'd put myself in that category. Like, in when I was in academia, you know, I've, um, you know, I, two master's degrees. I was earning a PhD before I eventually um, abandoned that pursuit, and and I throughout all of it, I never felt smart. And right. I decided smart is a dumb idea for me to try and pursue anymore. I don't want to pursue that because I'm never going to get there. Um, so is it is it kind of that? Um, yeah, you're never going to. F- you're actually never going to feel like you're actually the expert. Like you never have enough information, or or is it like I like I said? It 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 seems to me it's more advantageous for you to maintain the learning stance and to call yourself an expert might kind of break you of that. Um, I don't know. Is does it yeah. even this feel more true or I, no, well I, I agree or, I, or is I, there some other thing that I'm not I definitely up on? identify with the whole never feeling smart thing. Yeah. Even though I know that I know a lot about things that some people just don't know much about. I mean yeah. we could sit and talk Beatles all day if you want, and that would be We've done that. We we've, have done we that. We have we've done that. We could do the same thing with you two or other different uh-huh. you know. Anyways, there's certain there's certain places where I can dive super deep, but even then I wouldn't say like, oh, I'm an expert. And I think that's what it is. It's like, I yeah. don't feel like I've arrived, nor that there yeah. may, maybe is necessarily a point of arrival when it comes to really anything. Fives don't know the point of arrival on things. Yeah. So when it also happens when we're talking about ready. Am I ready? Like, am I ready to start a podcast? If I waited until I felt ready, I never would because fives never feel ready. They never know when it's time to move from preparation into action. Right. Um, and and so that that's kind of the same thing. Like, when is it that I move from being a learner into an expert? Where when if I accumulate enough knowledge, no, the five is going to be like, no, there's more to learn. There's still more to learn. I'm not there yet. Like mm-hmm. we know, we don't know when we're there yet yeah. on things, and I, and I think that's so. I think it's I think it's both things. What you said, uh-huh. I think it's what we just identified is there really is never an uh, an ending to the learning. So I don't feel comfortable saying I've arrived, yeah, because I don't I don't feel like there is an arrival point there. But also, it's good for me to proactively, consciously say I am never going to be done learning, and that helps me to naturally have yeah. the curiosity and momentum to keep the show engaged. So you've learned how to leverage that, which is great. So here's what's resonating in me with this. And I wonder if there's even a twinge of this with you guys, or if this is just my peculiar 
take on five energy that's doing this because I know I, I do a similar thing with my various projects where I actively resist presenting myself as the expert necessarily. Um, I'm more conf- I'm more comfortable being the learner or the questioner in this situation or um, or I'm just trying to engage people in a conversation in a very horizontal way. However, whether I'm conscious of this in the moment or not, there's a piece of me that does that as a way to prove how I'm superior to other experts, (laughs) right? I'm a better expert because I'm maintaining the right perspective for an expert. Mm -hmm. I'm doing expertise the way it should be done. Fuck those other guys. (laughs) Yeah, um, it's it's um okay. So I I have observed this, and I'm not calling you out on it as you <laughs> as you kind of have called yourself on it out already. But point being, there there are people out there who would say, "Oh no, I'm I'm not done learning. I'm a lifelong learner," and they say that to sound humble, but really it is them going even further than calling themselves the expert. They're, yeah. I'm, I'm a superior expert because I'm a lifelong learner. Yeah, I get, I get that you can't ever know enough, which is something you don't really get. Lifelong learners never say the phrase lifelong learner. Yeah. You're not even asking the right questions. <laughs> <laughs> I've probably fallen into that uh, at times. I don't know that I have it as strong as you do, though. <laughs> Just knowing you, Steve. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't think that it's full on arrogance, but it is like part of what you described is a dynamic within me as well. I'm never quite confident in mm-hmm, my in mm-hmm. what I know. I'm never quite confident in my expertise. You have to but build if I, a false confidence. I, if I think well, about things differently, I have a I have a confidence through the back door kind of thing. Well, if I ever am seen as an expert by other people, I can't let myself do that oh, shit. Oh yeah yeah yeah. It's it's hyper self awareness yes. of the so called yes. experts and you knowing you can't be that way. Yes. You have to be better than that. If I mm. fall into expertise, I have to do it the right way. That's that I mean, I'm right there with you. That's exactly it. Because I've seen so many self proclaimed experts and how they carry themselves in many different facets, and I just say no, I can't and, and I think that's also a third reason as to why I won't claim it is mm-hmm. because I don't want to be associated with people who claim it themselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm wondering if this is a, simply a five thing or if, if there's a little bit of fourness in the wing. Well, see, that's a, that's a question I had because you say probably six wing. Yeah. First I think so. four wing for me. Yeah. Have, have you looked at wings much? So uh, only the, the Buffalo variety and different <laughs> flavors that come with that. But other than that, not necessarily. No, those are more delicious. I prefer those. Uh huh. Now I'm hungry. Well, look, it, we finished this up. We can head straight there. Okay. Just so I like you, it. Yeah. And you wouldn't be home alone? When? <laughs> this is making sense. We're yeah. figuring out the future as we go. Uh-huh. Basically, it's that early in life, you settle into your energy pretty quickly. You lean into one of the wings some as a way to balance you out some because any particular energy on its own doesn't do a great job navigating through life. Mm-hmm. It's hopeful if you can switch into at least some other skills occasionally. So a five earlier in life will tend to develop a six wing or a four wing. Yeah. And it's four for me because four is that competitiveness and it leans into the productivity podcast okay. aspect okay. of it. I do. Oh, yeah. I, you're, you're, char- you're, uh, you're jogging my memory with okay. some, having a conversation with somebody because it's like that. Oh, in the same way that I can, let me see if this makes sense in the same way that a five will shift into overdrive in a sense to go to an eight, to be yep. aware and, and present socially, I will then shift over into reaching to my four wing to be non-social, but be incredibly productive and prove that I am worth what I'm doubting myself worthy of. That's wonderful. I wish mm-hmm. I had that part of the four energy because mine is all the whole self-indulgent suffering edge of four. Oh, I go there too, but like... Again, the four. <laughs> That's why some people would say, oh, you're a four because you do the productivity. But no, by, by no means. It's actually I'm a five hiding as a four in plain mm. sight. Mm. 
I'm showing you. I'm like out there like this, like Batman with with his cape. The four is my cape. And you can't be both Iron Man and Batman. I know, right? They're but not they're even both part of the same universe. So billionaires, anyways. You can. I, I mean, Batman is four. Iron Man is five, and and they're the mm. ends of the horseshoe. There's a spark across there, right? I see Batman as a one, to be honest. Oh, oh heck no! Yeah. It's all trauma. He wears black and purple. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> He's the trauma superhero. Hey, you guys, you know, when we get <laughs> when we get far, far enough out, like we'll come we'll do an episode and like say okay, here here's the examples of the superheroes that would fall underneath each of the different types. That would actually be fun for me. Superman is a 3. It'd be a blast. It would be hilarious. Ooh. <laughs> actually, uh, <laughs> uh, I was kind of joking about He's Batman when, Batman, but yeah, Superman, Superman and one. his ideals, yeah, I think yeah, that he one. actually is the one. Yeah. Um I think um, most interesting villains are ones. Everyone beats up on eights, and I think villains tend to be. They're, oh well, they're an eight. Uh, actually, oh, I think yeah. they're ones. I, well, this, we, we we've discussed Thanos and how yeah. how Thanos is Thanos is a one is brilliant one. Yes, he he's he's doing this for the good of everyone. Shut up and take it. Yeah. If everyone yeah. I would just, just I know better. Let me do this. Yeah. They'd be better off. <laughs> yep. I've I I have this sense of the perfect world. It's just that it only has half the people in it, and it's just what needs to be done. And I'm going to do what just needs to be done. Ones love the word just. I'm the only one who has the courage to do what has to be done. Yep. Although you know Thanos getting rid of half the people does seem very appealing as a five. So (laughs) it does. It does. Whether I'm whether I'm the half that gets to stay or not. Right. Even, it's even like either way, I'm I get to get <laughs> out of here, or there's less people around me. So, anyways, wow, that's dark. <laughs> yeah, there you it's go. Very dark. There yeah, you go. That's See? the 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 five darkness. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking about a five who can look like a four sometimes. Yeah, one of the five subtypes does look very four-ish, right? The sexual, um, because they actually do have a a much stronger sense of like feeling in the moment mm, and can right. really kind of like, like access it in a very four way. Right. Um, especially when it comes in to their, their, their one-on-one relationships. Hmm. And, um, uh, but I don't feel like that's the kind of no fourness no. that you're talking about. Cause you Not don't necessarily know. Yeah. We haven't talked about instinctual stacking, but you don't strike me as a sexual five. Have you looked at in social sexual so this is new to me. Yeah. So, t- okay. so school me on this. Cause I, am not completely aware as much as I have self aware, hyper self awareness. I'm not self aware of this. I think last time we talked about it, I described it. So Steve, it's your turn to sure. hear it. Um, it can be a little difficult to suss this out at first. It took me a while before I had any confident sense of how this would apply to me. Basically, regardless of what your type is, there are these three kind of motivators, or you could say three ways of operating within the world. So there's the, Self-preservation, sexual and social. Self-preservation is functioning on your own, how you operate on your own, etc. Sexual is about one-on-one relationships, not just sex, but, you know, Seth and me hanging out at his house in those, like, periods where we're not talking or whatever, that still qualifies as, as the sexual dynamic. I feel like you're trying to start rumors on Twitter. Uh, I'll start rumors wherever they happen to s- spread. That's fine. Cool. And then the social is exactly what you think. It's, it's how you operate in groups. And so the idea is we call it ins- instinctual stacking because you do all three, but one of them is on top of the stack. So that's primarily the realm that you're good at, that you're good in. And then there's one in the middle that you're kind of so-so with. And then the one on the bottom is your blind spot. So for me, self-preservation is on top of the stack. So I'm a self-preservation five they double down on all the five tendencies to isolate, to castle up, to withdraw, to restrict feeling, etc. Like self-preservation fives are probably the most withdrawn of, of all any, any of the, the types. types. Probably. probably. Yeah. And you're a social five. A social five. And so a lot of those five tendencies for castling are a little moderated. Mm-hmm. Um, In fact, we tend to likely... like to have a select few people within our castle. Like yeah. it's not just me in the castle. There's other people who like they're 
there across the moat in the courtyard. I still could go up to my high tower when I want to like really be secluded, but there's there's people in the castle with me. Whereas for me, the closest people in my life are lucky to maybe hunt on my property. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, it's rare that anybody comes inside for a snack um, or whatever. (laughs) It's rare that the drawbridge is let down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, But, like, a a sexual five would at least have a courtyard where the the special visitor gets to come in or something. Well, and the the sexual five is probably the one who's most willing to let someone deep into the castle. Yeah, But just that one. And they're searching for that one to let in. Um, has the potential to do that one at a time with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, but one but at a time. But the one gets... Yes, one at a time. Potentially one gets to come very far in. Um, so yeah, that pursuit of the one-on-one, very profound understanding is a big deal. And I don't know if Steve mentioned, but the three different instincts do correspond to... You're familiar with like the triads where the eight, nine, and one are the gut triad. Right. That would be the, the sexual. The two, three, and four is the social triad, and that's the social... And then the five, six, and seven are the head triad. That's the self-preserving. And so these, they show up in the triads when you look at the Enneagram as a whole, but then when you go on each ty- type, they show, those instincts show up again. So even though I'm a head type, I'm a five, my primary instinct is the one associated with the heart triad, the social uh, instinct. So was that enough to give you some sense of what you might be? Yeah, so... Um, well, it's interesting. I think that, I think the difficult thing for me is I can see myself in all three of those. Mm -hmm. So, cause I can see, um, I can see being very much closed off and not letting anybody in. I think maybe though, that may just be seasons in the past Sure, where it's just like, and let me throw this in. Let me use my, myself as an example. I think that there was a time in my 20s where I was probably a sexual five. In fact, I would suspect, this is one of my Enneagram hunches, I would suspect that there's a whole bunch of people in their 20s while they're away at college that their primary instinct is going to be the sexual instinct because there's a lot of desire to find the one person during that time. Yeah. And, and so I would say that I was probably a sexual five for a long time. And then I slid, you know, at some point the social slid up into that top spot. And I would say that sexual is my, like my secondary now and yeah. self-preserving is my third. And so I think, I think I've probably, I think I was probably, I don't know, depending upon which point in time in my life, like in high school, I would have said I was social. Okay. And then in college, I would have said that I was more sexual. Mm -hmm. And then after, (laughs) strangely enough, after getting married, I would have said I'm probably more self-preservation. Oh, so you've really run the gamut. So I would say I probably went social, sexual, then back to social. Like I've been, I think, I feel like that's the weird thing is Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been all three of them. And I would say right now I'm probably more social. Okay. But that's where I feel like I am right now. Sure. So, and, and I, that's and the I, thing. This is this is one of those things where yeah. it's not so hard and fast. At least I don't think so. I think yeah. that at different times you are going to um, like different instincts. You're going to feel different instinctual needs, and you're going to to kind of switch out. Not being pigeonholed is actually a sign of health for the mm-hmm. enneagram as a whole. The more you're able to not be limited to certain behavior patterns and motivations, but to engage a lot of different kinds of energy, that's a sign of health. So it's actually good if you found yourself in a lot of different places. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And and I think the reason that I would say social now is I'm not all about having no one in and I'm not about having even just one person in. I feel like, no, you know what? It's to my benefit to have certain people with different levels of clearance and I let them in at different mm-hmm. times and places and, you know, so. Levels of clearance yeah. is <laughs> apt. Because there's certain people that can get in the courtyard. There are certain others that are allowed to come in to the, to the I don't know, anyway, we could make the whole the, metaphor the, build the, out. The, but the, I have the, absolutely the foyer. revoked yes. people's clearance before. Yeah, like you're not allowed anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have boned it. <laughs> 
<laughs> your security badge has been uh has been Yoink. yeah has been reclaimed yeah so that's i think that's where i'm at right now So Eric, thanks for coming on our podcast. We really You're appreciate welcome. It. Yeah. Um, so yes, thanks. Is that working? Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Okay, it's good. been on for almost uh, eight, almost well nine minutes now. We're right? gonna I'm run out of time again. <laughs> God damn well, it! This is this is this says anyway, eight gigs, so it should be fine. I can't believe I can't believe we've been running on a shitty two gig card all this time. What are we? Sub two gig operation. <laughs> Erica, tell us one more time where everyone can find your stuff. Yeah, it's easy to find. It's beyondthetodolist.com. And, you know, that's where you can find my show as well as my social buttons to find me, talk to me, etc. If you feel like not being alone in your fiveness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that you you can you can connect with me uh, that way. So excellent, cool. Yeah. Well, once again, one final time. Thanks. You're welcome. Once again, this has been the E9 Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at E9 Podcast. You can follow me at Seth Harshman. And you can follow Steve at Skeptical underscore Monk. Thanks again for listening.